Remember, everything was set, everything was cared for. Our department was set. The things that we could control in the church for this weekend. And just a couple weeks ago, the Lord allowed the enemy of our creation to send us lemons. <laughs> and I guess you've heard from Pastor Rhino that uh, the, the, the speaker that we had originally thought uh, would come uh, was not able to because of a sudden health complication. And when you are in a position where you are leading out and you have a responsibility, you have committed, uh, if you are a person that is guided by God, you will know how to make what out of lemons? Lemonade. How to make lemonade. So this is our lemonade for this weekend. <laughs> our uh, dear uh, brother and pastor, uh, Peter, and he's been able to uh, be able and willing to come again Amen. and to share his uh, life and his passion, which is to share Christ, uh, especially uh, as representation of the ministry that is uh, um, being uh, led by our brother that was originally planning to come here, who is making a special ministry to those of the higher classes. We live in what's considered the sixth most expensive city in the world to live, which is Seoul. And so we have also a spiritual fiduciary responsibility to that uh, st strata of the population. And so I hope that uh, we can be guided by the Spirit as we are led through the words of Pastor Chung to be able to know how to relate to everybody, especially to that sector that is often uh, neglected uh, by uh, many of us. So without much further ado, I will uh, ask the pastor to impart to us the Word of God. Amen. Good evening and happy Sabbath. And just to let you know, I am not David Kim. Um, David is actually, uh, I call him a human ministry. And um, I feel really bad that you're not, uh, he's not here with us because he is a very special and gifted preacher. And so I'm here as a relief pitcher here today uh, to sub in for him. And uh, in spite of myself, I just ask that the Lord bless in spite of my efforts that you'll be blessed by the preaching of the Word of God here today. Amen. And so it's a privilege and honor to be here. I just came here uh, to do my own little side projects and to actually enjoy David Young preach. But it's interesting how circumstances <laughs> switch so quickly. And um, thank you for thinking of me well enough for me to sub in for him. And so before I begin, I'm going to ask for prayer. I had a very interesting day today. Um, I didn't bring dress shoes to Korea. And so uh, my uh, cousins from uh, Jinju, from Gyeongsangdo province was coming today and they were bringing my dress shoes for me. And so they came around uh, four or five and I rushed over the Hagi on the bus and then came back here. And so I had quite an adventure today. They match though, they match. Oh, okay, praise the Lord. They're not my style though, but <laughs> amen. I can't complain. But uh, before I begin, let's have a word of prayer. Um, Today's message is dealing with the message that we need to give to those in our communities. The message. Once we know the message, we know the mission and the method. And so today, the message of what we share and how we share it. And before I begin, let's have a word of prayer and ask for God's presence at this time. Let's pray. <clears throat> Holy Father, our Father God in heaven, Father, I am in need of your grace right now, and I need special Holy Spirit power. Amen. And so, Father, your people have come here sacrificing their valuable time to gain a blessing from the preaching of your word. Yes. So, Father, in spite of myself, may I be a blessing and a curse to your people. Amen. And, Father, may Jesus be seen, Amen. and may lives be touched, yes. and may, may we receive the Holy Spirit in great power Amen. to reach a city that's in dire need of you. Mm -hmm. Father, as I have traveled throughout the week, throughout the city, I've noticed people caughtness of sadness and of anxiety and of depression, of fearing about the economy and 
the future of this nation. And so, Father, we thank you that you have given us the three angels' messages of one of hope of the everlasting gospel mm -hmm. to fill every heart and every need. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, today, may we understand the privilege of sharing this end-time gospel message and that minds and hearts be touched and more souls be added to your kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The title of my message is Dreaming of the Rock. Dreaming of the Rock. The book of Daniel is often a book that we see in connection to the end of the world and the persecution of the little horn and a beast. Often we focus especially on what the little horn is doing. And often the book of Daniel, even for some of the Adventists, can be seen as something that is fearful something that has great anxiety to us. Oftentimes the accusation of the Seventh-day Adventist prophetic message is that it is doom and gloom. But I'm coming here to share with you that the end time gospel message, our prophetic message, is one of hope. It's one of assurance. In fact, the Bible says it is the everlasting gospel. So it is good news. So how is the good news connected with all, all these beasts and what they're doing and persecutions and these trials and tribulations and these oppressive kingdoms. Well, by trade, I'm a historian. I'm a history teacher. And I teach high school students history. And a rule of a historian when you look at a source is to understand the author of the source. Understand where the author came from. Understand the circumstances of the author. Why he would write in such urgency of such forceful language of why he wanted these kingdoms, these beast kingdoms to be destroyed. And so when we do a case study and examine the life of Daniel, we can then understand why Daniel wrote the prophetic message the way that he did. And once we understand how Daniel wrote it, we can see that is a hopeful message. It is a message of the gospel. And so, what was the circumstances and biography of Daniel? You see, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 17, we have discovered that Daniel's fellow countrymen and perhaps his family and friends were brutally slain by the Babylonians. How would you like it if your entire church membership, your church family, your own family, your own friends were all killed by invading force. In fact, we were threatened by an invading force just 30 miles away, are we not? <laughs> Daniel's, hope of, uh, Daniel's home city of Jerusalem and his place of worship was destroyed. His church structure, his Samuk University, his city, his hometown, his house was all destroyed by invading power. It gets worse for Daniel. Daniel was carried away captive against his will. He was a prisoner of war. But it gets worse. Daniel was mutilated against his will. He was made a eunuch. How would you like it when your intimate parts are mutilated by an invading force? And the cherry on top. Daniel was forced to go to school against his will. He had to force to go to a Babylonian school. And so Daniel was a broken man. He was an oppressed man. He was one of dust. He was an outcast. He was considered the dirt of the earth to the Babylonian power and to all the rest of the earth. The Jewish people were outcasts. Their nation destroyed. Nothing. They were dirt. And oftentimes, we have hesitancy to share the word of God with other people because we feel that we're not good enough. We feel like we're not articulate about the word of God. We feel like... We're just not measuring up to people, but God uses the lowest of the low. God uses the broken. God uses the oppressed to do a special work. So none is disqualified from sharing the word of God. Amen. And God desires you to know no matter what your background is, no matter what circumstance, be it rich, poor, middle class, no matter where you are, no matter what you did in the past, God can use you. Amen. As God used a broken, oppressed prisoner of war, to do a special work. And so, Daniel's oppressor was given a dream. And notice what the dream was. Notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 32. 
We're going to do a Daniel chapter 2 study today, but it's going to be a little different from what you're used to. Daniel chapter 2, verse 32, the Bible says this. This king, Nebuchadnezzar, was given a dream. And what was the dream given to the king that was the oppressor of Daniel's people? This image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Now, when you examine these kingdoms, we know as good as something happened, this is gold is Babylon. The silvers are the Medes and Persians. The belly and thighs are Greece. The iron is pagan Rome. And the mixed Amari clay and the iron is papal Rome. Now, what do these kingdoms have in common? Gold, Babylon, government established forced image worship with a death decree. It was an oppressive power. So it had a state-induced religion that if you don't obey the state religion, you will die. Or the Medes and Persians, what type of power were they? Forced decree, forced decree preventing the free exercise of religion. Remember, Daniel was prevented from praying. And if he prayed, he would die. Throw on the lines then. Babylon, you must bow down to the image or you'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. Both kingdoms are oppressive powers. They are going against the liberty of conscience and the religious liberty of you and I. Then you have Greece. Greece is interesting. Greece represents forced cultural and intellectual assimilation. In other words, if you don't have our culture, if you don't have our fashion, if you don't have our educational system, if you don't have our morals, you're an outcast. Sort of like in America, if you don't believe the agenda of Hollywood and the left and liberalism, you're an outcast, you're a bigot, you're this and that, you're old fashioned. That was the spirit of Greece. Then you have pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was forced allegiance to the government. If you go anything against the government, even though it's un unjust, you will die. It's sort of like in our country, in the United States, if you, dis you, you disrespect the American flag, we will take away your livelihood, as professional sports stars are knowing right now. And then you have the mix and mari clay, which is papal Rome, which is the merger of government and state, government and the church, to impose a state religion of oppression that leads to persecution. So all kingdoms of this image is oppressive powers that takes away liberty. And so the message of Daniel chapter 2 is one where these oppressive powers will be defeated and freedom will come. So what happened to all these oppressive and abusive kingdoms? And notice what, uh, notice what uh, inspiration says before we go there. This is a, this is the... This is um, my breakdown if you wanted to take a picture of it, but anyway, <laughs> I didn't get to that point. Notice what inspiration says, Youth Instructor, uh, September 22, 1903. The image revealed in Nebuchadnezzar while representing the deterioration of the kings of the earth in power and glory also fitly represents the deterioration of religion and morality among the people of these kingdoms. As nations forget God in like proportion, they become weak morally. Mm. But what happened to these kingdoms, these oppressive kingdoms that were oppressive powers through the rest of the earth? Notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 3, 4. The Bible says this, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were out of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. In other words, these oppressive, abusive kingdoms that oppress people, not only Christians, but all people, will one day be destroyed. And freedom will reign. You see, our end time gospel message is one of freedom. It's one of liberty. It's one of peace from oppression because all these kingdoms are oppressive. And what does the stone represent? Notice the Bible says in Psalm 18 verse 2. The Bible says this, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So the rock or the stone represents Jesus. And Jesus will deliver those who are oppressed from these kingdoms, and these oppressive kingdoms will be destroyed. You see, Daniel was oppressed by Babylon. Daniel was subjugated by an oppressive power. So when Daniel was given this vision, of course he wanted this power to be destroyed. And so this writing of Daniel, and also in Revelation, you know John? 
John was a convicted criminal of the Roman Empire. He was in a penal colony. He was forsaken in an island, prison. And of course, when Daniel and John write about these prophecies, of course, they're anticipating the end of these oppressive powers. Our message is one of hope for the hopelessness. And so there's another description of this rock and this image, and we study, we're studying the book of Revelation right now. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 6. This is another description of that time when the rock destroys the image. Revelation chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible says this, And the heavens departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens, and the rocks, and the mountains, and, so, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. In other words, you know what these great men and rich men and chief captains, you know what they were? They were officers. They were agents of the oppressive kingdom that would be destroyed. And so they were fulfilling prophecy when they say, fall on us because Jesus is come. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and the face of from the wrath of the Lamb. So those citizens who supported the oppressive kingdom will ask the stone to fall on them. Now, a lamb. Is a lamb a scary animal? Is a lamb a beast of prey? Last time I checked, uh, last time I checked the lamb is vegan. <laughs> he doesn't eat or consume other animals. So here are these people that are hiding themselves from the face of the Lamb, Christ Jesus. Why? Because they were oppressing his people and now they knew that they were exposed. And so if you're in a situation where you feel like you're living an unfair life, if you're standing up for God and you feel like the whole world is coming down upon you, if you're standing up for God in a campus and you're ridiculed, know this, Jesus counts your tears. Jesus counts your heartbreak. Jesus knows your pain because Jesus also went through, you went through when he came to this earth because he identifies with every single pain and every single opposition that you have because Jesus suffered through it. He can identify and by his stripes we can be healed. Amen. You see, we have a choice. We can have the rock fall on us or, as Luke chapter 20, verse 17 says, And he beheld him and said, What is this that is written, the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon the stone shall be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So we have a choice. Either the rock falls on us, or we fall on the rock. You see, the rock falls on those that have pride, that seek to control other people that seek to use religious manipulation and government manipulation to do an agenda of selfish purposes. The, those that have the rock fall on them are oppressive. They're not humble. They're one of pride. And pride come up before the fall. But those that fall upon the rock know their true condition. They know that they need to be broken by Jesus. And by being broken by Jesus, Jesus can rebuild us up and by all things beautiful. He can make all things beautiful in his time. Amen. Through humility and trials, our pride can be broken. Those whose pride leads them to persecuting others will have the rock fall upon them. The whole issue of this image of Daniel chapter 2 is pride. They take the place of God and want to seek control and oppress others with their religious state system and therefore will be destroyed. And what is the reason why these, this oppressive image will be destroyed? Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. This is another description or amplification. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and faith to change times and laws and they shall be given unto him to a times, times and dividing in time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. In other words, that persecuting power that seeks to destroy God's people, judgment will come to that institution, that power, and shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it to the end. God will prevail. 
And that is the theme of Daniel and Revelation, that although God's people are on the verge of defeat, although God's people is on the verge of being destroyed, although God's people looks hopeless, there is hope because God will prevail. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence is of things not seen. So what becomes of the stone that destroys the image? Notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing hole floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A plain stone becomes a beautiful mountain. You know, a stone is not very beautiful. Stone is plain looking. But a mountain is beautiful. You see, there's a gospel lesson in that. Christ came plainly to this earth, did he not? He came born to a poor family. He came born, he came not to declare his divinity, but to identify with our humanity. So he came as the lowest of the low. And by his plainness of coming the first time, he will raise a beautiful eternal kingdom. Amen. And when Christ was in his deepest humiliation, who prophesied that he will establish his kingdom in glory. The Bible says this in Isaiah 53, verse 2 about Jesus. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, hath no form nor beauty or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire. Now, we know this nation is very visual. Is that, is that correct? Looks are everything. But Jesus came plainly to show the beauty of his character because he will make all things beautiful in his time. And when Christ was in his deepest humiliation, he prophesied this. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 64. This is when Jesus was in the courts ready to be killed or condemned to die. The Bible says this. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Here Jesus is tortured. Jesus is whipped. Jesus is in his ultimate humiliation. It looks hopeless for Jesus. All his disciples forsook him and left. He was standing alone, and he was telling them that I will have a kingdom. You see, God is trying to teach us faith. God often puts us in hopeless situations so that we could believe in God's word. You see, faith is believing God's word, even though it appears to be hopeless. The same faith that had Abraham and Sarah when Sarah was in her 90s. Now, I was not good in science. I'm a defective Asian. That's why I'm history. <laughs> but my limited biology classes in high school tells me that it's impossible for a woman to sire a child in her 90s. The only difference was, is that God's word said it, and it happened. Amen. So in the midst of hopeless situations, there is hope. So our message is, although it looks hopeless in this world, although the economy is going down, although things are not going the way we are, there is hope. Because God's word says there will be a new heavens and a new earth, and there is a place for you in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. He will make all things beautiful in this time. A plain rock will turn into a beautiful mountain. And what is another promise of what God will do to these oppressive evil kingdoms? Know what the Bible says in Revelation 17, verse 12. I believe that's our Sabbath school lesson. Yes. The Bible says this, and we're talking about the judgment of Babylon in our Sabbath school lessons. Isn't that correct? Yes. The Bible says this, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive powers of kings one hour with the beast, they have one mind and shall be given their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make, the, make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. God is going to uh, lead his people, permit tribulation to a midst of hopelessness, to be in a place where it looks like apparent defeat, to prove that there is a people that will believe in him, no matter what the circumstance. And you know what? This is a side note. And this really irks me. You know, when people talk about the mark of the beast, they say it's Sunday worship. I'm going to say something very controversial, but it's biblical. The mark of the beast is not Sunday worship. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, if you 
read it carefully, that the image of the beast will be imposed and those who do not worship the image will be killed. So in other words, the mark of the beast is not Sunday worship. The mark of the beast is forced Sunday worship. There's a difference. So a little bit of evangelism 101. Don't go to your Presbyterian brothers and sisters saying that you have the mark of the beast by worshiping on Sunday. Because no one has the mark of the beast right now. The mark of the beast, what makes the mark of the beast the mark of the beast is not Sunday worship. What makes the mark of the beast the mark of the beast is forced Sunday worship. You see, what God hates more, according to the spirit of prophecy, is God hates force. When you force someone to a religion against their will, that is the spirit of the Antichrist. And so God is desiring us to understand that our message, the third angel's message, is one of liberty and one of freedom. And even though Daniel was displaced and the prisoner in Babylon, what hope did the prophecy of Daniel 2 Give this prisoner of war. Notice the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Amen. When this next superpower nation comes, because like it or not, I'll say it, there will be a time when it's controversial. I still have freedom as an American citizen. But that time is limited. The United States is not the last superpower nation on earth. Because the United States will fade away. The kingdom of heaven will be the last superpower nation on earth. And it will be eternal. It will be the true land of the free. Free from sin. And home of the brave. <laughs> and so this is the crux of our prophetic message notice but it gets sweeter who is given this kingdom notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 7 verse 26 but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end and the kingdom and dominion, the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. In other words, not only are you going to heaven, but God is giving you his kingdom. Amen. You know, we often say, oh, we just want to go to heaven. We just want to live forever. But it gets sweeter. God wants us to give us his kingdom. And what role does it play for us when God wants to give us his kingdom? Now what's in the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. This is the theme of the second coming. This is the theme of our end time gospel message. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So Jesus loved us, washed us from our sins with his own blood. In other words, he forgives our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we ask for forgiveness. Notice what happens. And have made us kings and priests unto God and His Father, to Him to be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Do you know, brothers and sisters, you are royalty? You are heirs to the kingdom? Why are we giving crowns of life? Crown denotes authority. Crown denotes rulership. So in other words, the message of the second coming is, brother, sister, although you are oppressed, know this, you are royalty. You are a future king, queen, prince, or princess. Amen. Now, I'm getting into Korean history right now, and I know during the Joseon dynasty, you had to be part of a certain family bloodline in order to be royalty. You cannot advance anywhere unless you're part of that bloodline. But Jesus wants to share his kingdom with you and I. You see, the difference between Jesus and Satan is this. Satan and Babylon wants to centralize power to themselves. Jesus wants to share his power and authority with you and I, broken people that do not deserve this grace. Oh, amen. This is the crux of our prophetic message. <clears throat> and do you know, 
Why Jesus does this? The Bible says this, for God commanded his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. In other words, we're enemies to God. We're responsible for killing Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, when we sin, we crucify Jesus afresh. We're the ones responsible. We were the hands and feet of the Romans to whip Jesus. We are the hands and feet of the Jews that ridiculed him. We are just as culpable. We are just as guilty as the Romans and the Jews of killing Jesus. But Jesus says, I love you so much that I want to forgive you. And I want you to be part and share rulership and authority in my kingdom. What powerful grace is that? And so he wants us to be kings and priests, but it gets sweeter than that. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. You see, when we're forgiven, that love, awakened of love, when we truly understand how much Jesus has forgiven our sins, that awakens love, and then we start to obey him. Not because we want to earn our way to salvation, is because of the appreciation that Jesus has given for us in Calvary and how, what great lengths that he did to save us from our sins. That will compel us to obey him no matter what opposition, no matter what trial, no matter what people say against us, we will obey him because we love him. Amen. And you know what a beautiful thing about God's law is? It is to free us from the consequences of sin. God's law is meant for our happiness. If you look at the law of God, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not skill, uh, kill, thou shalt not covet. That's freedom from the consequences of sin because sin may taste good, it may feel good for a season, it may be entertaining for a moment, but then the consequences of the guilt creep, creeps in. And then you're in the bondage and you feel something is not right. Jesus does not want you to go through that. That's why he gives you and I his law. Mm. It is meant for our happiness. So let's not be sad for this. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> we should be happy. Amen. Not like the people in the subway. They look all sad today. <laughs> but God has given us a message to bear. And so Jesus wants to share his throne with us. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and I sat down with my father in his throne. So Jesus himself not only is giving us a crown, a kingdom, but also a throne, his throne, that he's sharing with you and I. To rule with him to the ceaseless ages of eternity. This is the message that we should bear. And so, when can we experience this beautiful experience. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel, this good news, this end time gospel message of the kingdom, what is this gospel of the kingdom? You and I are royalty. You and I are kings and queens and priests. We are forgiven our sins. We don't deserve this kingdom, but this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. In other words, it's an invitation to tell people, guess what? You're oppressed, you're royalty. You're royalty in the eyes of God. For a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. We have work to do, brothers and sisters. The message drives the method and the mission. So one thing that I've understood about people is this. People are in pain. The rich, the poor, the middle class, they're all in pain. The rich are depressed. You look at it, the rich know that there is something that they are missing. In my country, how many celebrities are going on rehab with drug addiction? How many celebrities and athletes blow all their money in their rock bottom? Because God does, did not design us to live in that life because God wants to give us something better. And God has given our church, God has given us a message to bear to share with these people that there's hope. And how are, to how are we to preach this message? The Bible says this. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. 
In other words, the Bible says this. We are to preach a prophetic message that Jesus is coming soon. But in connection with that, the Bible says repent. What is repentance? It is telling the people that God is willing to forgive them. And repentance is the response to the love that God has given to the sinner that he is offering pardon. And so a message of the prophetic message with a message that Jesus is seeking to forgive and forget our sins. You know, we have this verse of our Adventist message unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. You know what the whole point of that is? You know what the whole point of the investigative judgment is? Jesus is trying to blot out the records of our sins. In other words, Jesus is seeking to forgive and forget our sins. And I know as a Korean, we remember every bad thing that happens to us, don't we not? We have some good memories of bad things. But Jesus, that knows everything, is choosing to forget all the bad things that we do, including killing him at the cross, so that we could be saved. And once this message is preached, we you know, the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says, and, and as we go, preach saying, King, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, our prophetic message. But then there's a connection. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely given. In other words, we have a healing message. Our message is a holistic message to make man whole or woman whole. Our message is a message to fill the emotional and physical brokenness that God has given us. God has given us a medical missionary health message to make us whole for these last days. And in connection with our prophetic message, God has given us a message where we could live a life and life more abundantly. Amen. And that's what God is seeking for us to do. And so what role do we represent right now for this kingdom? Notice what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We're almost done here. The Bible says this. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as through Christ did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, ye be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors to God. We represent the embassy of heaven. And so when we realize our identity is royalty, we then make the invitation to those saying, Brother, sister, you could join the royal family of the kingdom of heaven. Come ye. The doors are open to the embassy to become a new citizen. Citizens of this kingdom. You know, the message of repentance, repenting and believe the gospel. Um, I don't know if Korea gets this, but in America right now, there's a lot of heresy going around right now. Thanks to YouTube. Everyone has a YouTube channel. And so usually the people that say Jesus is coming on March 21, 20, I don't know if you heard that or not, but that's been popular in some circles here in the United States. And some prominent pastors have also bought into that message. They're saying that Jesus is going to come on a certain day. The Sunday law is going to happen on a certain day. You know when, you know when the seven last plagues will fall? You know when the Son of Law is going to happen? The Bible says this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. I'm quoting this from memory. The Lord is willing, not that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. In other words, when people make their final decisions, in other words, when people can no longer change their minds for or against God, that's when the seven last plagues fall. But right now, we can change our minds. You see, in Revelation chapter 16, when you look at the seven last plagues, the Bible says this, they repent not of their sins. In other words, the plagues are falling, the judgment of God are coming, but nothing will change their minds. They have already made their final decision. But right now, there's time. But then when we make a habit of rejecting God, it becomes like concrete. So we should break the habit today. Amen. And so, as I bring some final points, how certain is this dream? 
Daniel chapter 2, verse 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great gold, the great God have made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the, inter and the interpretation thereof is sure. It is going to happen Amen. with great certainty. God is going to have a people on this earth that will be broken and messed up and be the dust of the earth, and the dust of the earth will be lifted up and become royalty. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. And so, when will this happen? Preach the message. The message of what we call, fancy theological term, justification by faith in connection with our prophetic message. Mark chapter 1 verse 15. The Bible, and once we preach this message that Jesus is seeking to forgive and forget their sins, and if they reject the message, there's going to come a time the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that, how many? All should come, All should come to repentance. In other words, you know how, you know how, I'm, I'm, confession, I'm terrible at math. I tell you, I'm a def defective Asian. The only gift that I have academically is running my mouth and writing. So my dad told me once, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're gifted in all the non-money-making jobs. So that's why I'm a high school teacher. But I enjoy it. But the Bible says this, the Lord is willing not that any should perish. In other words, you know the parable of the, 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 the lost sheep that Jesus went for that lost sheep if Jesus sees one person that can have the potential of repenting he would delay the second coming for that one person oh, praise the Lord. 99 and 1 see our math and God's math is different mm -hmm. God's math values the individual you know the spirit of prophecy says that we each and all of us have a distinct relationship with God. All of us fill a piece of God's heart that no one else can fill. It's a puzzle piece in God's heart that no one else could fill because you as an individual is seen by God as someone unique and special in Him. That's why He's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end shall come. The message of this dream was given to a displaced prisoner of war who lost his family, home, place of worship. He was abused by being made a eunuch. But when this hopeless prophet, God brought the message of hope. Amen. that God will deliver and make things right that the oppressive kingdoms of the earth will be no more and God will establish his kingdom forever mm. that's our end time gospel message Oftentimes, you know I was there in my early days of ministry I could prove to you with current events and with, with news clippings how close the Sunday law is and it was good to talk about uh, prophecies and end-time events. I'm not discounting that. But scary people will, know, will not do anything. Because they'll be convicted just for a moment and say, Oh, wow, Jesus is coming soon. And they come out worse than before. That's my observation. God does not want us to be fearful. He wants to give us a sound mind and the assurance that He loves us. We already see, the world already knows this world is falling apart. We see it everywhere. The environment, the pollution here in Seoul, it's springtime. It should be beautiful, but look at all the pollution now. God is trying to remind us, my child, this world is not your home. Amen. And I am coming soon. And the message that we need to give, sort of remix it in a way, reformat it, to emphasize that Jesus is coming to make things right. Jesus is coming to make you and I whole. Jesus is coming to make you and I royalty Amen. in the kingdom of heaven. In closing, I want to share this. In Revelation 21, 
and Revelation 20, we have the New Jerusalem coming down to the earth. We have established that we as humans, God has given us an invitation for us to be royalty, that we would sit in God's throne, that we will have his crown, but it gets even that much more sweeter. You know why? The only world that rebelled against God is this earth, this planet. And what God is doing when he established the new Jerusalem here on earth, you know what he's doing? He's relocating his capital to the very planet that killed his son. He is reestablishing his capital in the very place of, that caused him so much pain. That forgiveness and redemption is all throughout Daniel and all throughout Revelation. God's love is saturated in these prophetic books. And once we as Seventh-day Adventists harness this mingling of the prophetic message with the love of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit through prayer, God will declare and give us the power to preach what's called a loud cry message. And when we have this loud cry message, we could say to those in those broken governments and systems, those citizens, because God has a people everywhere, come out of her, my people. Our message was on healing and redemption. And God has given us a healing message. Amen. A message of hope. As my ministry that I'm privileged of, the revelation of hope. In the midst of hopelessness, there's hope. And so, brothers and sisters, today, do you feel discouraged? Do you feel like your ministry is in a wall somewhere? Do you feel sadness and despondency because doors are closing all around you? Do you feel the loneliness and emptiness because you feel like life is unfair? Know this. Jesus knows. Jesus sees. And Jesus is knocking on the door of our heart saying, My child, let me in. Let me fill you. Let me heal you. And by my suffering and stripes from Calvary, you could be healed. He is inviting us to be royalty here today. And once we realize our identity, once we realize our mission, when we realize our identity and mission, you know what we do? We have certainty of who we are. When we have certainty of who we are, no one else can tell us who we are because we already know who we are. We are a child of God and we're royalty. And when we know that we're a child of God and we're royalty, we have the boldness to go to people and say, brother, sister, you know what? Come here. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. God is seeking to give a message of hope in these last days. To the rich, to the poor, to Moon Jae-in in the Blue House, <laughs> to SM Entertainment, to the Idol Stars, to that Big Bang Scandal guy, I forgot his name. <laughs> he needs Jesus too, amen. amen. The Lord is willing not that any should perish, amen. but that all come to repentance. Amen. And God has given us that message. Amen. God has given us that directive. God has given us that hope. If God could use a mutilated, broken, oppressed, prophet, outcast to declare a message, how much more can God do for you? Amen. Our Father and God in heaven. Father, we thank you for your grace and your love for us. We thank you that in the midst of hopelessness there is hope. Amen. And so, Father, today, we just ask that if there's someone here today under the sound of my voice that's feeling discouraged for being a Seventh day Adventist, if there's someone here today that feels the loneliness and the brokenness of a society that is so unforgiving. If someone here today that feels the pain of being treated unfairly, Father, may they be filled with your love and to be healed from their brokenness here today. And just like you use broken people in sacred history to do a mighty work, may they realize and understand that you love them and that you seek to use them in a mighty way to be ambassadors for your kingdom and to be royalty to sit forever with you in the kingdom of heaven. 
And brothers and sisters, as the heads are bowed and eyes are closed, is there someone today that said, Father, today, I want to receive your healing message. I want to be filled with your love. I want to be made whole so I could preach this message and share this message to a world. I want to share with my friends. I want to share with my family. I want to do something great for you, but Father, I know that I'm broken. I know I'm unworthy, but Father, now I understand that you use, you use unworthy people today. So if it's you today, brother, sister, that say today, I want to accept the invitation to be ambassadors for you, simply ask that you raise your hand. That is you. God sees your hands. Father in heaven, I am raising my hand. And Father, we thank you for your grace and your love. Amen. That you're seeking to redeem us and to make us royalty. Amen. And we ask that you be with each and every individual here to bring healing and restoration. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Chung. I wish I was as effective as you are. <laughs> you know, the Bible it says when uh, when Paul was talking to God that that uh, uh, His power is perfected through our weakness. So the more we are willing to recognize our weakness, the more He can work through us. It only takes one for revival to take place. So thank you again for tonight's message. This is a good beginning to tomorrow's continuation. Uh, let's invite other people to make sure we are all here, uh, enjoy each other's company, and also strengthen each other in uh, faith. Uh, last Friday, uh, we had the schedule of our former youth pastor. Next Friday for Vespers, if he's willing, he can be the next Vesper speaker. So, not putting pressure on you, but it's, it is uh, open for you <laughs> to redeem yourself. Just kidding. <laughs> all right. So thank you again for coming, and God bless you all. Happy Sabbath. See you tomorrow.